Hi, this is Bob, co-host of Practicing Connection. Did you know an estimated 24% of our nation's active duty service members and their families are food insecure? I hope you'll join me for OneUp's 2023 Military Family Readiness Academy, Military Families and Food Security, a call to action, as we mobilize family service professionals at federal, state, and local levels to focus on expanding food security for our military family population. You can find out more about military families and food security, a call to action at oneop.org slash MFRA slash food security. Welcome to Practicing Connection, a podcast exploring the personal stories and collective practices that empower us to work together to improve our resilience and readiness in a rapidly changing world. Here to start the conversation are Jessica Beckendorf and Bob Birch. Hello, this is Jessica Beckendorf. Welcome to the Practicing Connection podcast. Today, we'll be talking about making intentional and deeper connections, one of the eight ways of cultivating community resilience that we identified in our Connecting Communities and Asset-Based Recovery project. In 2021, we worked with our colleagues Bridget Scott and Cheryl Kniesel to host interactive workshops with the purpose of providing a space to share our stories of community recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Participants in the workshops included military family service providers, extension educators, community developers, and others. Using the asset-based community recovery framework, which was developed by Jonathan Massimi and Heather Keem for the Tamarack Institute, we worked together to identify the interdependencies, capacities, and assets that had emerged from the COVID-19 pandemic response. The stories participants shared in those workshops helped point us toward what communities did really well in their recovery and what they could do better. As we reflected on all of the incredible stories we heard in these workshops, Eight themes for building individual and community resilience emerged for us. We're going to discuss each of these themes in a separate podcast episode. We started with the episode, Grounding Yourself in Your Strengths and Values. If you haven't listened to it yet, you can find it uh, wherever you found this podcast episode. In this particular episode, we are going to discuss the theme, Making Intentional and Deeper Connections. We'll be talking about both intention and deeper connections because they both play a part in community recovery and resilience. In the asset-based community recovery framework, Masimi and Kim write about the increased number of connections we tend to make when a community is first faced with a significant challenge. Once a community moves out of the crisis stage, people begin paring down the number of connections they have and deepening their remaining connections. Participants in the asset-based community recovery workshops told stories about making new connections and about deepening existing relationships. Yeah, people said they felt a greater sense of connection during the pandemic. One participant said that hearing pandemic stories reminded them we were all living through this shared crisis around the world and that we could all support each other's work globally as we work on and share info about our resilience strategies. Other participants shared stories of new friendships and connections that had been forged during the pandemic. And just in general, there was a feeling that social networks had widened and that the participants found new connections and reconnected with old friends via social media. We heard stories about how their connections deepened during the pandemic as well. Many families, quote unquote, stuck together at home, uh, had uh, found that they had more time for meaningful conversations. And the simple question, like, how are you, took on more meaning given the newfound space uh, to give an authentic answer to that question. Participants shared that they had developed stronger connections with their neighbors and an increased feeling of camaraderie with their colleagues as everyone attempted to deal with the challenges of this crisis together. You know, Bob, I actually discovered um, a lot of new friendships or found a lot of new friendships during the pandemic. And I was able to work on some international teams through some associations that I belong to. And today, um, I still remain friends with many of these people. And, you know, I really did widen my own, my own network as well. And a couple of people I've been able to meet in person since then, uh, that I only met online during the pandemic. And it was really lovely. Yeah, I mean, I think it 
we think too of the sort of um somewhat of a meme that arose during the pandemic of people making sourdough bread um right <laughs> like these hobbies as well as as making new connections like all of a sudden we had some space to do that and mm -hmm. i think that's one of the things that as we talk about this particular theme from the asset based uh, community recovery workshops it's one of the things that we're trying to hang on to and I think that's kind of the point of what we want to share today as we're talking about in this episode is how do we hang on to at least some of that space to forge those new connections and also deepening connections. You know, we heard people talk about uh, all the new information they got from their coworkers, like even even now, Jessica and I are recording this on Zoom. So I get to see a little bit of her house in Wisconsin. She gets to see a little bit of my house in North Dakota. We get to see each other's pets and some, you know, things like that. And people experience that during the pandemic, sometimes for the first time, like seeing a coworker have their pet jump in their lap is a way of providing more bandwidth of information about that person. And that's really how we deepen connections with each other is increasing that bandwidth, the amount of information we have about each other, the diversity of that information so that it's not just uh, information about me as a coworker, but me as a person, me as a dad, me as a, as a spouse um, in our, in all of our different roles. And, you know, in order to do that, we have to spend time talking with each other about more than what the next task is or what project we're working on or, you know, yeah. you know, whatever's going on in our work lives. It, you know, thinking about work too. So at extension often, and I guess I'll just speak from my own experience, but I have talked to a number of other extension colleagues um, across, you know, from many different States. But one of the things that I was experiencing and didn't, a hundred percent realize it before the pandemic was actually how isolated I felt in my work. Um, because here I'm the only person who works in my particular program area in a particular County. And so I'm not alone in that I'm working with the groups that I'm working with and I have those connections there, but in, as a profession, um, I felt pretty isolated. And during the pandemic, we found so many more ways to work together across our geographic boundaries that I felt I finally felt like I was working on teams again, and I wasn't this kind of entity out in the field by myself working with the groups that I work with. So that was really cool. And I can imagine that other professions have kind of a, you know, some similar um, characteristics where it can feel a little bit isolating sometimes to be a professional doing what you're doing for the clients that you're working with or for the community that you're working in. Um, and to not have very many, especially in rural areas, right? Not having very many um, people around who do what you do. And so the pandemic for, for me was, um, it expanded my network in that I, w I became closer to my colleagues and much deeper friends with um, my colleagues across the state. Um, and so now like there's some that I, I'll drive three hours to go and stay with them for a weekend uh, that I wasn't doing that before. So yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's why we're talking about it and why it makes so much sense that this theme emerged when we were talking about uh, community recovery is that level, that depth of information, that level of trust is what's necessary to lead to collaboration, um, right? If you're not talking to people about what you do or what you care about or what you want to change in the world, you know, you're never going to have the chance to connect with people about that. And it, it just want to lead into that. And as, and as a reminder, lead into the idea that this is really not just talking to the same people over and over again about that, but talking to, you know, people uh, from diverse, in diverse roles and from diverse backgrounds to lead to that, co that collaboration as well. But all of that kind of going back to where we started, all of that takes space, you know, time and space to do that. And that's part of what we try to do. And I think it's, you know, it's a practice that I see others do as well as taking some time to share information with each other, either at the beginning of a meeting or throughout a meeting or at the end of a meeting that goes outside of the boundaries of the role that we're playing in the actual topic of the meeting. You know what I'm saying? 
I do. And I don't know if you know of Chad Littlefield's work. Um, The connection before content, I think, is something that he says very often. I have a really hard time getting groups who are coming together about a particular topic to see value in connecting with each other as human beings before they dive into the content. And I think both can happen at the same time and probably both should happen at the same time. Um, you know, diving into the content that you're the work that you're there to do together while you're getting to know each other. But um, this idea that um, the connection is such an important part of the content of getting the work done together um, is really intriguing to me. And um, yeah, I recommend if you haven't checked that, checked out his stuff, uh, you know, we'll put a link in the show notes, but um, it's, it's some good stuff. So let, let's get into some of the practices that support making intentional and deeper connections. There's three practices we're going to suggest here, and they're all related. Intentionally making connections can build trust. It can build trust necessary for collaborative work, like some of the stuff that we were just talking about, the groups that I was working with. Building trust necessarily for collaborative and community-based um, response and recovery, and frankly, just for collaborative work in general. So the first practice is taking stock, like an inventory of the people that contribute to your resilience. If we're talking about collaboration and community, you know, it might be a little bit surprising to that the practice starts with taking stock of your resilience. But this is how this is how this starts, right? Is like we can only make connections one person at a time. You know, we can't build relationships in mass. Um, and so it's difficult to like launch a a coalition or a, you know, a collaboration or even a network just all of a sudden without kind of starting with, hey, what about my personal resilience and who am I already connected to? I mean, you haven't seen what I can do with a microphone, Bob. So that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. No, no, I agree. It's It really does, you know, start really one person, one conversation at a time. So I think that's why starting like with your own social support network, you know, it does a couple things. I think ultimately here we're talking about community resilience and individual resilience is part of that. Um, we can't really have community resilience unless we have as many as possible individuals in that group uh, practicing, you know, good good resilience practice and feeling like they can they can weather uh, the challenges that life that life brings. So that's the first practice that, that Jessica's talking about is identify your social support network like who are you connected to and who really plays a role in your in your resilience and what role do they do they play how do they support your resilience just can i talk a lot when we present with groups about this about having not just a lot of connections right that's something that dr michael unger talks about in individual resilience is like one of the one of his 12 uh, keys to resilience is lots and lots of supportive uh, relationships. But in addition to lots and lots, you also have to have some diversity there, right? Not every person in our life is going to play the same role in and meet the same needs that we that we might have. So having lots of different diversity in terms of even the level of connections, the folks that you, you know, uh, are your colleagues that maybe you don't have a ton of personal information about and you don't share a ton of personal information about that, but you can laugh at a joke together um, and that, you know, they can smile at you on the Zoom meeting and those kinds of things. Th those people are important to your resilience, just like the person who you can have deep, thoughtful, you know, conversations about what you're going through um, or, or, you know, getting feedback on a potential decision you know, about your life or work or whatever. So anyway, I'm dominating the conversation here, Jessica. But... <laughs> no, I, this is stuff that we talk about all the time. And um, it's stuff that, you know, we're both really connected to. And I think in the past, you know, from, in, we've used the term because this is a real term that's out there, emotion shifts, right? There might be different kinds of people that we go to for different reasons and for different types of of support um, toward our resilience. And so thinking about who is in your life, that's that who is in your social support network that um, supports your resilience and how they support your resilience, I think it's really important. So that's the first practice. The second practice then is another inventory and it's taking stock of the people whose resilience you contribute to. 
um, right? Relationships are a two-way street. <laughs> and um, and you are an asset to other people, right? Just like they're an asset to you. And so there might be people um, who maybe don't show up on your first list as super strong, but maybe you provide a lot of um, support to. And that's okay. We're not, this isn't quid pro quo. You don't, it doesn't have to be even, but it's really more about you understanding who you're supporting, who's supporting you. Yeah. I think that's a great point that it is not, it's not how networks work. <laughs> we mm -hmm. talk a lot about networks here and we are talking about your social support network. Not every uh, connection is equal uh, in strength. In fact, most are not equal in strength. Um, and so there might be a little bit more support going one way or the other, and that is completely okay. And all of this is sort of, not to get too far ahead of ourselves here, but all of this, I think, is sort of it, uh, emblematic or transferable to to wider groups too. And I think that's like really important. Like when we, if we can look at our own resilience, how we support other people's resilience and how they support our resilience as it's okay to be variable, not just in terms of the intensity uh, going each direction, but also the intensity over time. Like it's okay to have someone who really, really, really was supportive of you through a challenging time and provide a lot of support. And then maybe they don't have the capacity to do that anymore because things change. And so they don't have to do that for you consistently throughout your whole life. Maybe the exceptions for maybe, you know, parents, spouses or whatever, but, <laughs> but we can only provide uh, the support that we have capacity to, and that's going to vary over time. So we're trying to give you that idea that if we can get an idea of that at the individual level, we could be more accepting of that at the, at the group and community level, where I think my experience is people are really intolerant of that, right? Like if you are doing a collaboration, there are a lot of thoughts that pop into our head about, is everybody giving equal effort? Um, and that can be really harmful to collaboration because it's just not going to be the case that everybody is going to be able to do equal effort all the time, you know, and make the same contributions. Yeah, that's such a great point. And what I love, so I'm about to share the third practice, uh, third and final kind of practice that we're sharing today. Um, and what I love about all of these practices is that it's not, none of them are very difficult to do. Um, you might think of someone while you're out for a walk, you might be like, oh, I forgot to add this person to my list. And then you can just go, you know, when you get back, you can add them to your list. But um, in general, this should be, these all should be kind of living, changing uh, living and breathing kinds of um, lists. And the other thing I, I thought of, Bob, when you were talking is it's almost like, um, you know, analytics uh, for your analytics for your network. And uh, the reason I thought of that is, you know, I have refused up until well, I still have refused to get a uh, an Apple watch or like one of the smart watches, partly because the analytics just freaks me out a little bit. And at the same time, I think about how important relationships are to our resilience and how important relationships are just to life in general. And we have all these ways of measuring and tracking our health. Um, and uh, we have ways to track our, our resilience, but we often don't think to. And it'd be really cool if Apple uh, or some other smartwatch would develop a way of measuring our social, like if there's some biometric that could tell us if we're that like would low be, on social. That would be either really cool or really frightening. And Scary, I think right? anybody who has seen the Black <laughs> Mirror episode uh, about that, you know what I'm talking about. That might be really freaky. Um, I clearly so, haven't seen that. Yeah. Um, so maybe yeah. I, I'll add yeah. that to the show notes. We will link to the Black Mirror episode as a, <laughs> as a warning that as a warning. for you not to create an Apple Watch that can measure your relationships. The bottom line here is keep it all on paper. Okay. Right, yeah. <laughs> so the first is taking stock of the people that contribute to resilience. The second practice was taking stock of the people whose resilience you contribute to. And the third one is taking a look at those lists and identifying any gaps in your needs, um, in your resilience needs. So where are the gaps in your social support network? How can you fill those gaps by intentionally seeking or deepening connections with others? One example I can give is I realized recently that I have a number of people that I get together with one-on-one -on -one 
but I'm not really doing group things. And I really enjoy like group events. Like it's just, um, it really feeds my resilience. Um, I enjoy, uh, I use this example uh, when we were, when I was speaking at the senior spouse leadership seminar, um, where uh, I need karaoke, right? It's, <laughs> that supports my resilience and it's super important to me. And I haven't been doing any of those things. Um, I've just been doing one-on-one meals, which I love. I love all the people I do that with. And I also need that kind of other level of connection that I haven't been getting lately. So yeah, what are the things that you care about that maybe you don't have somebody to to talk to uh, about um, or work on together on or or those kinds of things? You know, I think that's really what we're trying to do here. And again, I keep talking about sort of taking this to the next level. I just want to emphasize here that we are talking about collaboration and community resilience. And so all of these have lessons and repeatable are repeatable practices that you could just shift this you know, take stock of the people that contribute to your resilience, take stock of the people whose resilience you contribute to, and then identify the gaps. You can just shift that to like an issue in your neighborhood, you know, or in your community and, and think about, okay, who contributes to addressing this issue, right? You know, what are the other, what are the other factors that might affect that issue? And where are the gaps that maybe we could fill in and provide more assets to, um, and so, but let's, let's kind of continue on with like some mm-hmm. action steps in terms of, of the individual resilience thing, because you have this list and you have this list of gaps and we're encouraging you like, oh, go out and fill those gaps, right? Well, how do you do that? Um, and we have, you know, over the years borrowed and adapted and uh, talked to John Stepper about the working out loud process. So a lot of these ideas come from, from John's working out loud process. Um, that's another one for the show notes. So we'll get you a link to that as well. But, you know, with, with John's working out loud process, you know, you just start with another list. Who would I like to connect with? Who am I already connected with that I'd like to deepen those relationships? And that's really the first step um, in being intentional about it. And, you know, when you think about that, make sure you're focusing on your needs and goals and are you're seeking out people who can contribute to your resilience. Sometimes my tendency is to to seek out people who uh you know would make me feel better if they liked me maybe or something or 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 that I could feel like I could name drop somebody or wouldn't it be cool to be friends with that person? But that's great too, but it, it maybe is not something that would really feed my my resilience. I just have to say that I think that the list makers out there are loving us right now. They, they do. They have um, like so many lists. <laughs> um, so once you have that list of people, so after you've analyzed, you know, what gaps there might be and you've you've thought about a couple of, of folks that you can get in touch with, then make a plan for regularly reaching out to the people on that list. I think that's the hardest part. I'm pretty good at coming up with like, a list of people that I should reach out to and maybe even reaching out to them the first time. And then this idea of regularly reaching out to them um, does tend to be a spot that I get stuck in. When you do this, I mean, for one thing, it's this kind of continual building of relationship and trust, of course, um, hopefully of a friendship or of deepening friendship, if it's someone who was already a friend of yours. Um, but yeah, reach out to your connections with um, what we call the, and I think we got this from John Stepper as well, the universal gifts of attention and gratitude. So, you know, sharing of yourself this way in a spirit of generosity helps deepen your connections as you go along forever and always. <laughs> yeah, those universal gifts are so helpful, especially with new connections that you're making. Everybody loves attention. So just saying, I see you, you're like, hey, I saw your work. Hey, I heard you say this in this big meeting where we hadn't got a chance to meet or whatever. Um, and gratitude, you know, thank you for, you know, what you're doing. Thank you for, um, you know, writing this book or posting this tweet or you know, Facebook post or whatever it is, you know, just thanks. Um, and, uh, obviously we, in one up, we, we, uh, 
are in the military service provider context, you know, we provide professional development for military service providers and other people who serve military families. So that gratitude is something that's kind of, you know, is baked into our culture here in the U.S. of like thanking people for their service. So should be a reinforcement that um, that gratitude definitely is the universal gift. Another thing that you can do, I think, and especially when we're trying to deepen relationships is to practice deep listening skills. Um, we walk through so much of our life sort of on the surface of the water. Um, we're just kind of going. Um, I, here, I'm going to tease Jessica a little bit just for fun on the podcast. Um, we had a meeting earlier today and she and and I was saying something. She's like, what did you say? Or could you know, did I understand that right? Because she got an <laughs> email. So embarrassing. She got an email from IT. I've done the same thing. So I shouldn't really yeah. call you out. You know, like you <laughs> see okay. You see an email notification pop up when you're when you're talking with somebody and you like can't help is like why is that person emailing me or I didn't really need to get to that you know and that's just an example of like we're kind of going on the surface all the time and so practicing deep listening skills or active listening skills is another way to to look at that can really help you build that emotional connection with people and deepen those relationships, listening to learn and listening for understanding increases the bandwidth of information you have uh, about people. And we talked about how important that is. And it also gives you insight into what you can do to contribute to their resilience and maybe what they might be able to provide to contribute to your own resilience. Um, I just want to mention a little bit about active listening. Carl Rogers is one of the researchers who came up with active listening and and he talks about three important principles for effective counseling but i think they're really great in this context too and those three principles are empathy so putting yourself in someone else's shoes understanding how they might be feeling genuineness we usually jessica and i when we talk about this we talk about authenticity i think that's the same mm -hmm. same thing just being yourself and then i love this one unconditional positive regard and that is that getting rid of that judgment part of us and really like positively regarding this person, regardless of what it is that they're saying. And so that active listening really uh, is a tool that fosters uh, connection and the kind of connection that we're looking for. So that's another way to practice this is just practice those active listening skills. I really love that description of active listening, because I think a lot of times when people are taught active listening, they're taught sort of a very kind of mechanical how to do it, right? You listen to what someone said, you reflect back a version of what they said, what they just told you to check in for understanding. Um, and I've actually always found that to be quite surface level rather than deep listening. Um, I think what you're talking about feels like deep listening. And I wanted to add something to you. You mentioned listen for um, listening for understanding. And it reminds me of a book I read by Alan Alda um, called uh, if I understood you, would I have this look on my face? So this idea of listening for understanding isn't just like listening and like screwing our face up into like a tight, you know, trying to understand what they're saying without actually asking questions. The important part of listening for understanding is being curious and asking questions. And that's really a great way to um, also practice active listening, right? Because you actually just heard what they said and you're asking them to tell you more about what they said, um, as you're trying to understand, right? So, I mean, you can listen to what they're saying and just like tighten your face up into like a, I don't get it kind of way, <laughs> or you could just ask them some more questions. You can learn more about how you can help connect communities to build their resilience. Uh, and these eight themes that we've talking, talked about uh, or will be talking about in upcoming podcast episodes um, from our free booklet, Eight Ways to Cultivate Community in T Times of Change, which is full of practical ways that you can boost your community building and deepen your relationships. Uh, if you want to receive a digital version of that booklet, you can sign up for the Practicing Connection monthly email at oneop.org slash practicing dash connection, oneop.org slash practicing dash connection. Um, and that's all we have for today. So thanks for joining us. You can keep up with Practicing Connection by subscribing to the podcast in your favorite podcast app or signing up for the Practicing Connection monthly email that I just mentioned, oneop.org slash practicing dash connection. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at practicing CXN. 
Thanks so much again for joining us for this conversation. We'd also like to thank our announcer, Kaylin Goble, Hannah Hyde, and Terry Meisenbach for their help with marketing, and Nathan Grimm, who composed and performed all the music you hear on the podcast. We hope you'll join us again. In the meantime, keep practicing. The Practicing Connection podcast is a production of one Up and is supported by the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the Office of Military Family Readiness Policy, U.S. Department of Defense, under award number 2019-48770-30366.